Canada is a land of hockey, Drake, beaver tails, and of course, beer. But it wasn't always so, and how we became a nation proud of its brewskis has as much to do with marketing as it does taste. Joining us now to find out how we became a nation of beer drinkers, Matthew Bellamy, Associate Professor of History at Carleton University. Welcome, Matthew. I am. Thank and you for, for some me. reason, I'm very excited to have this conversation. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I wanted to go back a little bit in history. Uh, you write about a tragedy in the Walrus, um, and this tragedy happened Christmas Day, 1936. Mm -hmm. What happened? On that day, we had a guy by the name of James Sloan now, and he was driving home after a night of late night drinking uh, mm -hmm. with his friends. And we had just returned to a situation where we had public drinking in Ontario mm -hmm. after 18 years of this not being allowed. Mm -hmm. And so he's driving home, he's had too much to drink, and he's going back to the beaches in Toronto, and he's passing through the centre of Toronto and comes to the intersection of Jarvis and Fleet Street, and he loses control of his car, and the car careens through the intersection and hits this elderly man, a 65-year-old man, that had got up early in the morning of Christmas Day mm -hmm. um, to walk his dog, and the man and the dog die instantly. That's a tragedy, mm -hmm. an extreme, but even more tragic about this day is there were a hundred other accidents in Toronto that day. And of course, this mobilized wets and dries alike. The dries quickly come out, that is to say those people that wanted Don't prohibition. Drink. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. They wanted to return to the noble experiment times, the time that we outlawed booze in this country. Mm -hmm. And uh, so they come out and they say, this is horrible. It's because we've returned to this wet society that this accident happened. Mm -hmm. Indeed, a guy by the name of Dr. A.J. Irwin, who is the head of the Ontario Temperance Union, comes out in an op-ed piece mm -hmm. in the Globe and Mail and says, you know, the result Results couldn't be more disastrous to be left all the inmates out of 999 Queen Street, which is actually the insane asylum mm -hmm. in the province. And so the Globe Mail comes out and in an uh, article says this is the blackest Christmas that Toronto has ever experienced. Mm -hmm. Of course, the brewers have to get their acting gear at this mm -hmm. point. They want to protect the gains that they have made since Prohibition, and they realize that they're going to have to teach people to drink moderately, and so they get an educational campaign going that appears in the press. Now, at this time, when this tragic accident happened, yeah. um, how often were motor accidents attributed to, al uh, I guess, alcohol in those days? Yeah, oh, often, because you had these hundred uh, happening, and this is all in the post-1934 uh, period when you have people going out publicly drinking, of mm -hmm. course, and the car is becoming om more omnipresent on our roads, you know. It's not, yes, the post-World uh, post War II environment where mm -hmm. cars are everywhere and there's two cars for every household, but cars are generally, uh, you know, running through our streets, mm -hmm. and so there's a lot of drinking and driving accidents, and so this is something that the brewers want to be uh, on top of. And how uh, popular was the idea of prohibition at that time? Prohibition, so prohibition still is pretty popular with mm -hmm. a large segment of the population. It's about 35%. The thing is that we had this noble experiment that mm -hmm. happened on the backdrop of the First World War. Um, so we have Ontario going dry in 1916 and lasting until 1927. Mm -hmm. The thing is now with prohibition, it lasts longer in some places than in other places because the provinces have the jurisdiction over regulating the retail sale and importation of intoxicating beverages. And so you have PEI, for instance, going dry from 1901 to 1948. Right. Quebec got bless them, put up with a noble experiment for eight months, said, we're out. <laughs> so. This is not working for us. <laughs> right. um, what, what, what values do you think they were trying to impart at that time? Yeah, the prohibitionists? Mm -hmm. uh, absolutely. Well, the prohibitionists have been around for a long time in Canadian history. Mm -hmm. You know, they, it goes all the way back to the 1820s now. And they really don't gather steam, though. Mm -hmm. They can't win over a majority of the population because what you have is a wedge issue here. Mm -hmm. It divides the population kind of like abortion in Canada today, mm -hmm. right? 50-50 split. Mm -hmm. And so politicians don't want to touch it. They realize we're going to make as many friends as we make enemies on this one. And so Sir John A. Macdonald or a, a William Laure Wilfer Laurier mm -hmm. um, don't want to touch this one. Mm -hmm. And so um, it, it kind of you know, gains steam mm -hmm. as we get towards this, the First World War. What the prohibitionists do, though, and so you were asking about values, mm -hmm. what do they believe? So they believe that society will be a far better place if we can just summon the courage to get rid of the bars and the booze. Right. That's fundamentally their position. They say all of society's Ill, ills, mm -hmm. be it misery, mm -hmm. poverty, health defect, crime, family problems. Alcohol is causing it. Alcohol is causing it. Mm -hmm. So if you could just get rid of it, it's going to be a dry heaven on earth. Right. So that's what they're arguing. Mm -hmm. Of course, they've got to win over a majority of the population. What was the population's response? Like, what were their drinking, yeah. uh, uh, I guess, characteristics at the time? Yeah, so it seemed like there were two types of Canadians now, yeah. to oversimplify a bit. You know, those that drank to excess mm -hmm. and those that didn't touch a drop. 
So you had the teetotalers, those that were the dries, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, then you had those people, like our first prime minister, Sir Johnny MacDonald, who drank quite a bit, mm -hmm. you know? So In your article, you said he had like two bottles of whiskey a day or something yeah, like that? Yeah, yeah, that's according to his biographer, a guy yeah. by the name of Donald Creighton, uh, yeah. who is uh, past now, but is uh, one of his biographers, said that he was a drinker. Another mm -hmm. guy by the name of Jed Martinham mm -hmm. uh, is another historian of Sir John A. Macdonald, and he comes out and he says, no, Macdonald wasn't an alcoholic, he was mm -hmm. a binge drinker, that he suffered a number of personal setbacks in his life, and he turned to the bottle at times, mm -hmm. so. Uh, would, you, he, would they even call it alcoholism back then? Yeah, it would just the, be kind of like you're just having a public drink. Public drunkenness, yeah, <laughs> so, but he went on these binges, right, yeah. and he would disappear at times, and, mm -hmm. uh, but he was drinking the heavy stuff, which is some representative of all the population at the time, you know, before we were talking about Black Christmas, mm -hmm. and James Salone, of course, was tippling the beer mm -hmm. when, before he got into the car and started driving home to the beaches in Toronto, but most people weren't drinking beer. Uh, mm -hmm. during the period leading up to Prohibition. They were actually drinking hard alcohol, and certainly that was the case with McDonald. And how was alcohol at the time controlled? It, was, it wasn't, it, so you had this environment, a laissez-faire environment prior to Prohibition now. Right. And so people would go to the working class saloons, 24-7 working class saloons, mm -hmm. drink around the clock. And the argument of the Prohibitionists again were that uh, this was an environment that bred all kinds of problems, gambling, prostitution, mm -hmm. um, and, and the attendant vices that come along with those things. So what finally led the government to finally institute pro Prohibition? Yeah, so I would say it's two things now. Mm -hmm. uh, first of all, you have the outside lobbying efforts, that is to say, the efforts of the prohibitionists to win over that population. So they get involved in um, painting all of the liquor traffic, so that's the brewers, the distillers, and the vintners of the nation, with one brush. Mm -hmm. So they say there's no distinction. Today, you know, I think you and I, and probably the viewers of TVO in the summer, mm -hmm. uh, the agenda in the summer, mm -hmm. believe that there's a distinction between hard alcohol on the one hand mm -hmm. and beer on the other. 5% alcohol, 40% alcohol, big difference, right? Mm -hmm. But back then, the prohibitionists were saying, no, no. Everything. Everything. They're all as bad for you, right? Mm -hmm. And there's this one wonderful cartoon that comes to my mind, just popped into my mind, mm -hmm. and it appears in the Grip magazine. And um, it was by a guy by the name of John Ben Goth, mm -hmm. and it was called Miss Canada. But he's a prohibitionist, and so he's, it drives home this point that they see no distinction between the various types of alcohol. Mm -hmm. And then this, this image is of a hellish-looking urban tavern. And you have in this cartoon two individuals behind the bar, and one of them is Miss Canada, which represents the government of the day, and also her partner in this, a moral business of booze peddling, the devil, right? Mm -hmm. And the devil's tempting the various patrons to drink hard liquor, right? And she's working the, ha uh, the, the taps, the beer taps. Mm -hmm. Anyways, in the foreground are all the, the, the uh, problems that come along with a drinking environment in terms of, it, as John Bengoth would mm -hmm. see it. And so you have, for instance, in the center of this image, a guy that has obviously lost all his money, right? He's in a tattered three-piece suit, mm -hmm. pockets turned out, watches gone. I can see it. Yeah, mm -hmm. big nose, right, from mm -hmm. drinking too much. Mm -hmm. And then you have a fallen woman who is a woman who's turned to alcohol, and she's literally using her last strength to lift this bottle to her mouth, mm -hmm. and two little kids looking on. You know? right. Then you have two boys over in the corner skipping school, and then some guys fighting it out. Yeah. Anyway, so I was looking at this picture, and I'm thinking, what are these little bottles in the back? So there's bottles in this little image. And I got up my reading glass and then a magnifying glass, and there's various little labels on these, and so there's riot rum, anti-virtue whiskey, anti-school gin, murder malt. And I'm thinking, like, well, what's malt? Mm -hmm. And malt liquor, that's beer. So the message is clear, right? Yeah. Drink some beer, you're gonna go kill someone, drink yeah. some rum, you're gonna have a riot, but no distinction between them. Mm -hmm. So the prohibitionists are very good, leading up to prohibitions, of painting all the liquor traffic with Fear this one. Fear-mongering, maybe. Fear-mongering, yeah. uh, and that's key. And, mm -hmm. and, and actually, that leads to the second thing, mm -hmm. uh, is this fear-mongering, of course. The prohibitions start to realize, leading up to the First World War, that this is a hard fight for the hearts and minds of Canadians. Mm -hmm. And the most impressionable Canadians are the young mm -hmm. of the nation. And so they start um, releasing health readers in the various schools, mm -hmm. and they're full of prohibitions propaganda talking about, if you drink too much beer, your heart's going to stop, right? Yeah. And you're going to die. I don't know about you, but I was, I'm born in 67, so I was uh, a 10-year-old boy in 77, and I can remember being a 10-year-old boy, and the fear among, you know, my mother and her friends was angel dust, right, and PCB. And I can remember being asleep one night and my mom coming and grabbing me and walking me downstairs and plopping me in front of the TV. And as I'm wiping the sleep out of my eyes now, I'm looking over and there's my sister and she's got these saucer eyes, right? And she's watching this made-for-TV movie. It must be NBC or ABC. And it was called Angel Dust today. And it was a 
group of high school kids, mm -hmm. you know, who were beautiful and bright, had everything going for them, but then started to experiment with this drug. And there's this one scene that is still burned into my mind of this young woman, you know, taking a hit of PCB and then running down the third story, this corridor of this three-story high school, falling through the plate glass window, bouncing like a Super Bowl, and then getting up and trying to cut her wrists. And my point is, yeah. I'm not on PCB today, yeah. right? It's, so it worked. It's fear longer. Yeah. It's exactly what you're talking about. Yeah. They, they're doing it now. Yeah. We do it now with marijuana and other drugs. Mm -hmm. They did it in the 1970s with Angel Dust. They did it with booze first. With alcohol back then, what yeah. was the drinking li age limit? No limits, right? And, and so you were uh, kids as young as 13 could have a drink? Y that's right. And you were drinking in the home, and you were drinking morning, noon, and night often. Was and it expensive? Was it cheap? Like, how accessible was it? It was cheap relative to the other drinks. So we have to remember that there weren't a lot of other drinks available at mm -hmm. this time. Nowadays, you know, I always ask my classes, you know, what did you guys drink today? And they'll say, you know, what I've had my energy drink or pop drink or various things, coffee, tea, obviously. Those mm -hmm. things were very expensive during the 1800s. Uh, soft drinks weren't available and water could kill you. And so people turned out of, to alcohol out of necessity. Right, right. Uh, but when we think of prohibition, we think of the U.S. experience, people like Al Capone and right. Elliot Ness. How would you compare prohibition in Canada to south of the border? Yeah, so south of the border, you have a situation. Uh, so prohibition south of the border lasts from 1920 to 1933, and there you're prohibiting consumption and production. Here we have this kind of patchwork quilt. So uh, we, we could produce it here. We could produce it. But you couldn't it. drink it. You could produce it. So you have this division of powers between the federal and provincial government. The federal government has the right to prohibit the manufacture of intoxicating beverages. The provinces, as I said, uh, have this power to uh, prohibit its retail sale. And so the federal government only gets involved in the prohibition of manufacturing of alcohol for a very short period now, and that's at the tail end of the First World War. The rest of the time is the provinces and their prohibition. So you have a situation where our brewers could produce it, they just couldn't sell it in the province. Now, some brewers do produce it. Mm -hmm. The bats do it very well, of course, mm -hmm. at uh, uh, actually bootlegging to the United States. So. Wow. I think you already mentioned uh, Edmund Burke, yes. but uh, what was significant about him? Edmund Burke, so he is significant, you're absolutely right, um, because he takes over Labatt's corporation, in a way. Mm. So you have this situation. So prohibition comes into existence, like we were saying, on the backdrop of the, the First World War. And so you have this dry situation. As you might imagine, this is going to hurt the brewers and the vintners and the distillers of the nation. And in mm. fact, Half of our brewers go out of business during Prohibition. You start with about 150 nationally, and you go down to about 70 at the end of Prohibition. Does that affect the economy at all? Or? Tremendously, yeah. and that will be one of the arguments, of course, mm -hmm. of those wets in the back uh, after Prohibition uh, has been put in place. They're going to start making the argument, you know what, it would be far better for the economy if we legalized sale and had the government regulating its distribution so they could tax it and the like. Mm -hmm. But Burke, as you were asking, uh, he comes along and he actually takes over Labatt's corporation. He was a hard-nosed Irishman, mm -hmm. cut his teeth uh, selling tobacco and whiskey south of the border, right? Mm -hmm. Comes up to Canada uh, in the early 1900s and works his way up the rung of the corporate ladder. Mm -hmm. And by the time uh, the First World War um, starts, mm -hmm. he's the general manager. Uh, prohibition comes into effect in Ontario, like we were saying, 1916. Mm -hmm. Labatt survives for a little while by making this near beer stuff, kind of non-alcoholic beer that no one likes, right? Yeah. And so they survive for a little while, and then they teeter, and it looks like they're going to go over it. And there's this actually this hastily arranged board of directors meeting when all the family members, it's still a family-owned corporation in 1921, Prohibition's still going, mm -hmm. and they have this meeting, and all the family members are there, and they say, and I'm quoting the minutes here, unless something very unforeseen occurs, we're going to have to close down the business a year hence. Brooks watching all this, right? right? He's the only f non family member there, and he says, whoa, 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 yeah. <laughs> wait a second here. You know, I've got an idea. Why don't you guys take a vacation? Don't ask any questions, right? Don't hold any more uh, board of directors meetings. Let me run things. Give me and at 10 that point, they were so desperate. They were like, sure. Absolutely. Yeah. Exactly. That's yeah. right. And so he takes over, and of course, he turns them into a bootlegger. Mm -hmm. You know, he buys up a, a fleet of fishing ships, if you can imagine, down at the Windsor Docks, continues to brew full-strength beer, mm -hmm. buys Colby whiskey from the distillery down the road in Belleville, and starts shipping it over to the very people that you were talking about, Al Capone and the Purple Gang of Detroit. And it becomes a great success, Labatt's. It goes from a second-tier brewer to a first-tier brewer in the nation. Canadian history never <laughs> ceases to amaze me. <laughs> um, I want to show you a clip, and this is from Molson Canadian, and the ad is called The Canadian. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Let's take a look. When you think about Canadians, you might ask yourself, why are we the way we are? Well, the answer is laying right under our feet, literally. 
Fact is, it's this land that shapes us. There's a reason why we run off the dock instead of tippy-toe in. It's because that water is frozen six months a year. And that frozen water brought on a sport that we can call our own. This land is unlike any other. We have more square feet of awesomeness per person than any other nation on Earth. It's why we flock towards lakes, mountains, forests, rivers, and streams. We know we have the best backyard in the world, and we get out there every chance we get. Because it's not just the great outdoors we're chasing, it's freedom. And this place gives it to us at every turn. Here, we're free to chill out, free to unwind, and free to wind up. There's a beer that comes from the same land we let loose on, and it's proved to be as clean, crisp, and fresh as the country it comes from. So here's to everything this land gives us. Molson Canadian, made from Canada. The ad is actually called Made from Canada, but wow, I really want one now. <laughs> what, is the, what is the connection, what connection does beer have to the land? Yeah, it's, it's, it's a wonderful commercial, yeah. but, and you know, there's this great tradition. First of all, beer is made from quintessentially Canadian products, products that we produce internally, here, barley hops and fresh water, of course, and we have those things in abundance here. Mm -hmm. So our brewing industry goes way back to the 1600s. So we've done it very well. We've won international awards for our beer, so mm -hmm. I think that's part of what's going on in that ad. Mm -hmm. The other thing is, of course, is the national identity. Uh, there's so many things that divide us as Canadians, yeah. but I think that we have this northern climate uh, and great outdoors in common, of course, and that's very much there in this ad. When the brewers, of course, in the 1920s and the 1930s, Nam, when they were trying to bring prohibition to the end, they mm -hmm. were actually the first mm -hmm. to tap into the land, this great sense of uh, Canadianism. Well, and how effective is that strategy connecting beer with Canadian identity? Yeah, well, it seems, based on market share, it's done very well for uh, uh, Molson, and it did mm -hmm. very well for Labatt's and Molson, Canadian breweries uh, during their existence, of course. During the 1920s and the 1930s, Nam, when they were trying to fight off the prohibitionists, of course, they had to get people to reimagine beer in more favorable terms. And remember, we were talking about uh, them painting it with one brush mm -hmm. and saying they're just like the distillers of the nation. Mm -hmm. Well, the brewers uh, in the post-prohibition period, or at least in the period where prohibition looked like it might be questioned and come to an end, mm -hmm. and they were driving force behind it's coming to an end. What they do, of mm -hmm. course, is they get us to reimagine beer in more favorable terms, terms that are familiar today. Mm -hmm. Do the distillers benefit from this as well? The distillers benefit incidentally, but. Uh -huh. Beer is privileged. When you have public drinking return them, it's only beer. Uh, so hard liquor is kind of on the outs at this point. And the brewers are very good at saying, you know, we, we're, we're not producing hard alcohol. Mm -hmm. Ours is a temperance drink. People are going to continue to drink, right? Mm -hmm. And so we might as well provide them with this low alcoholic beverage that is somewhat healthy. The final thing, relating back to the land, like you were asking, mm -hmm. of course, is that the land in the 1920s and the 1930s, like today, holds a very special place mm -hmm. in the hearts and minds of Canadians. But, you know, I was asking various people on my way in here today what they're doing for the holidays, and many people said, that they're going up to their cottages, right? getting away from the city. Mm -hmm. This starts in the 1920s and the 1930s, people getting away from Sin City. That's where all the danger occurs, the labor uh -huh. unrest, right? Yeah. So they don't want their product associated with the city. Right. They want to sanitize it. So in all their advertisements, the beer drinker is never in an urban bar. They're always out in the cottage, cottage in down the lake, fishing, you know? So that's one of the ways they associate it with their land. The other thing is for the very first time, like Molson did in that wonderful ad, yeah. they start associating their product with the land by saying it's made from Canadian barley hops and fresh water. Oh, we're going to talk more about that. <laughs> but you mentioned public drinking. You can't drink in the streets, though. What do you mean by no, public drinking? That's right. In public drinking, I mean just in the restaurants and the bars. Okay. You're right. Can, if you go off to France, of course, you can drink in those streets. <laughs> you can do everything in France. Uh, to what extent did the debates about drinking back then mirror our current debate around marijuana? Yeah. We kind of touched on this earlier. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. It, it's fascinating to watch what's yeah. going on with the marijuana question. And I think what uh, those marijuana advocates uh, are arguing is very much what uh, the wets argued in the 1920s and the 1930s. The argument is, with marijuana today and booze back then, people are gonna continue to use these dangerous substances. People are gonna continue to drink. We proved that during Prohibition. Mm -hmm. People didn't stop drinking. They went into the blind pigs. Craig Heron, a wonderful social historian from York University, has written at length about this mm -hmm. in a great book called Booze. People continue to drink. Um, so the brewers are saying, we might as well, if people are going to drink, mm -hmm. give them something that is government regulated, so we have this watchdog, right, mm -hmm. and is mild. And that's the same argument with marijuana. 
people are smoking the marijuana, they're mm -hmm. saying. We might as well bring this into the open, get rid of the organized crime around it, tax it so we benefit economically, mm -hmm. right? And have the, the government watch over it so we get a somewhat safer supply. So there's some very, uh, there's similarities in the arguments. I want to show you a couple more Molson Canadian yeah. ads, and this first one is called The, Ra the Rant. Mm -hmm. Let's take a look. <clears throat> hey, I'm, uh, I'm not a lumberjack or a fur trader, and I don't live in an igloo or eat blubber or own a dog sled. And I don't know Jimmy, Sally, or Susie from Canada, although I'm certain they're really, really nice. Uh, I have a prime minister, not a president. I speak English and French, not American, and I pronounce it about, not a boot. I can proudly sew my country's flag on my backpack. I believe in peacekeeping, not policing, diversity, not assimilation, and that the beaver is a truly proud and noble animal. A tooth is a hat, a Chesterfield is a coach, and it is pronounced Zed, not Z, Zed. Canada is the second largest land mass, the first nation of hockey, and the best. Thank you. <laughs> of course you said thank you at the end. Um, what was that ad tapping into? I think it taps into this latent sense of national pride of the period. The ad comes out first in 2000, of course, and um, it speaks to this continuing ability on, on the part of the brewers and their ad people, ma'am, to tap into the underlying cultural logic of the age. Mm -hmm. Their marketing people found out that those people that were of the drinking age between 18 and 24, that all-important drinking group, right, right, were very much proud of their nation, right? And so this taps into this, and their market share goes up 2.5%, right? I have, I have another clip, and this yeah. one's the one that's called The Canadians. Uh, let's take a look. Hey, I didn't see you had a from yesterday. We were with the jack off. Give it to him. He had his own moments, yeah, but... So, he says, let's just scale the wall. It's not that high. <laughs> he was wicked, mate. She sang badly, but everyone loved her. They couldn't stop cheering for her. Going on. <laughs> the next thing I know, let's drink with Bega, let's enjoy it. I don't know what to do, right? I don't know what to do, I don't know what to do. I don't know what to do, I don't know what to do. I don't know what to do. And the best part is, she wasn't even from Dublin. Where was she from? From Canada, Tom. He was Canadian. Canada, too. Canadian. 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 Best night of my life in Rotswaka. <laughs> now, not everyone is a fan of that ad, you know, showing Canada, everybody talking about Canada. Um, here's one person's tweet about the ad. At Global Mail, at Globe Business, Molson Coors is only 50% Canadian, and this ad is 100% terrible. Who are we trying to convince we're cool? Um, so do you think the ad was too simplistic? I think the, every ad suffers from that, right? They're, they're pitching to a constituency now mm -hmm. uh, in defense of these beer companies, mm -hmm. I imagine. Um, and uh, so, yes, and I'm sure that there are non-gregarious Canadians that go abroad and, and don't light it up out mm -hmm. there. But uh, generally speaking, you know, um, uh, I like to believe, as a, believe of us as mm -hmm. a fun-loving people, the people that can go out and make friends anywhere around the globe. But there's no denying uh, that uh, um, the there are people excluded in this ad, and it doesn't speak to the general population at large. Yeah, and I think it's probably to the younger audience, perhaps, the younger beer drinker. Absolutely, yeah, yeah. yeah. But that again, that's the, the group that they want to hook, mm -hmm. uh, the people between 18 uh, and 25. So there'll be long-term customers. Right, right. Yeah. I think that that ad is successful uh, for the same reasons that the rant is. Um, at the tail of, end of the rant, as you pointed out, you know, Joe says, uh, thank you, you know, and kind of uh, hunches over and walks away humbly. And this one's very humble in a different sense. You know, you don't see Canadians in this ad, I notice. And so it's other people celebrating us. Mm -hmm. You know, I think perhaps our youth, you know, consider themselves great partiers and very gregarious. Mm -hmm. uh, I certainly do. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, you know, it's, I think what this ad does uh, so well is it has other people say it. Mm. 
not us as Canadians pumping ourselves up, but other people. But am I wrong to see that it's, it seems like beer is marketed to men, not women? Absolutely, okay. yeah. yeah. Um, what do you make of the irony that Molson and Labatt's aren't even fully Canadian anymore? They're not owned by Canadians. Yeah, uh, you, you're right. Um, uh, Labatt's was taken over in 1995. Um, I don't think, I think they will continue, Molson will continue, to, of course, to play up the Canadianness mm -hmm. of their product. Uh, decisions, corporate decisions are made uh, down in Col Golden, Colorado, of course. It's Molson Coors. Mm -hmm. Uh, but the head office is down there. Uh, Labatt's uh, has some wonderful products, but I think that their share of the national market is diminishing as well, for better or for worse, um, because of these microbrewers coming along. And I think that these large international corporations that have come in, of course, are um, promoting their flagship beers. So whereas Labatt's used to have their flagship beer blue and 50, um, uh, which is an ale, now what they're promoting is their flagship ale is uh, Bud. Uh, and uh, Budweiser and Bud Light, and it's no accident that uh, Molson's and Labatt's products aren't the best selling in Canada anymore. Mm. It's actually these international brands, of course, yeah. picking up the slack of these wonderful microbrewers that have come along. Very interesting. Yeah. Um, lots of countries have a reputation of being uh, big beer drinkers. Ireland, Germany, the Czech Republic. Yeah. What makes Canada stick out among the bevy of beer drinkers? That's a great question. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I think it's the fact that we uh, have this culture of moderation. You know, you, the nations that you point to. You know, if you look at the list of beer drinking nations on a per capita basis, all those nations drink more than us, and so we're not the greatest beer drinkers. You know, mm -hmm. there's other people that consume more, but we've struggled with the beer question. You know, we make it internally, we do it very well, we've won awards for our beer, so that's quintessentially Canadian, right? Mm -hmm. But it's the way that we drink our beer that makes it quintessentially Canadian. We do it in moderation. Generally speaking, we do it responsibly, and at the end of the day. Mm -hmm. So maybe that message worked during Prohibition. Exactly. Matthew, it's been a pleasure having you on the show. I've learned so much about beer that <laughs> I you. had no idea. Thank you so much. Oh, it's my pleasure. Thanks for having me. Help TVO create a better world through the power of learning. Visit TVO.org and make a tax-deductible donation today.